Hi, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I am talking to the person that runs the Madison Makers Market. He runs the their pop-up events that happen throughout Madison throughout the year. They're scheduled events that you kind of have to sign up for. I'm, I'm talking confusedly about it because I'm trying to remember back when I first heard about them. In season two of my show, I met someone who told me about the pop-up market and it confused me. I would run into them from time to time and I thought of, I explained this in the show, I think of pop-ups as something, it was like a flash mob. Like you would just one day show up and there would be a market there and all these creators, like they would, they would do it secretly undercover and it's actually an event. It's So the name always confused me. And a lot of the questions that I talked to him about, along with what does it take to run one? How did he get started in these events and running them? And how does he organize them? Because they're in different venues during the day. The, the same day runs in like four different places. So I ask a lot about that. But I also ask the questions that I had when I was starting out, kind of like, how do I find out about signing up for these? Like, when do they happen? What are the event dates? How do I find out about more of them? These were all questions I had starting out. So I really wanted to meet with him today to talk about those questions that I had because it took me a good year or so before I understood what it is I had to do to get involved. And also to help you with that point, there is two events coming up by the time this show airs. Uh, there's going to be one on June 18th called the Madison Makers Fitchburg Mini Market. So that's their June edition. And there's going to be, and that's going to be at the Delta Beer Lab. And there's another one called the Madison Makers Summer Market and Pub Crawl, which is going to be happening, happening July 9th. And that's in Madison starting, uh, I believe it's at several different venues, but you can go to the website that they have set up for it to find out more about this particular set of events that happen throughout the years, uh, throughout the year, not years. Well, I guess it does happen every year. Go to madisonmakersmarket.com and check out these events and more and sign up for the email list so you can get alerts when these events are happening. If you've ever wanted to get involved in one of these sort of things that maybe you've seen around town or you know, just to go check out stuff, even if you're not a maker and you want to go find out more out more about this stuff. Anyway, we talk about all that stuff. It's a great interview, uh, and it's starting right now. My name is David Van, and I am the owner and organizer for the Madison Makers Market. You are, and are you? originally from Madison. I, I know that we've met before, but I can't remember if you said you were from here or if you moved here from somewhere. I am not, although it's funny you should ask because this year is actually significant in that it marks uh, that I have spent more than half of my life in Madison. Really? Yeah. I'm originally from Green Bay, Wisconsin, a born okay. and bred Packers fan. Okay. And uh, I lived there until about two weeks after my 18th birthday. And as soon as I got accepted into college, I moved on to Madison. You were just like, that's the place to be Madison, the big, the big town. <laughs> I convinced one of my friends to sell me their car for $20 so that I could move all my stuff down here. <laughs> oh, the 1900s back when you could get a car, like I'll give you a dollar for the title. So it's legal. <laughs> oh man it was a beauty it was an old uh i don't know if you know cars that well it was a 94 oldsmobile delta 88 royale oh wow so a big one is what you're saying it was a big it was a it was a it was a, it was a family hauler uh we called it biff okay um why do we always after... give big cars names i did the same thing too like anybody who had a big car we gave it a name <laughs> i can't help it um we have a van right now um that is also has a name it's called goldie you know, I just, I can't help it. I have a, I personally also feel a very strong connection to cars. I was raised by two mechanics. So oh, wow. I, I can't help it. I just love cars so much. <laughs> it's weird that I do this for a living instead of being a mechanic, but I saw my dad be a mechanic for, you know, 25 years and it seems like it's really, really hard. And yeah, this is like, this is more headspace stuff and that works a lot better than my hands do. <laughs> so what, well, when you came here for college, like what kind of stuff did you end up doing while you were in college and then after you got out of it? So it's, it's actually kind of interesting. I didn't realize it until it was far too late, but I've been building towards a career path like this for basically my entire adult life. I went to school for graphic design okay, and um, I actually got a uh, minor in computer networking. So, you know, I learned all about like, emulation and uh, cross-platform interoperability yeah. and how to handle um, social media promotion in the really early days, 3D animation, all that fun stuff. 
And uh, it started with a really strong base in graphic design and advertising. Mm -hmm. So I was already into all of that uh, from a young age. You know, initially what I wanted to do was become a car designer. But then I realized that, oh, Pasadena College of Art and Design is one of the most expensive private schools in the country. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm not rich. <laughs> so I took so I, I, I set that aside and realized, you know, I can always circle back to it if I still feel that way in the future. But for now, I really just enjoy making images. I really enjoy manipulating with the visual arts. So I focused on that. And the whole time while I was uh, not in school, I was working in uh, warehousing and logistics. Um, I ran an underground concert venue in my basement that I did all the promotion organization. I got all the bands for I handled all the money for it. Wait, and what was it called? What was um, the Owl Sanctuary? Okay. When? How long ago was this? Oh, man. This would have been, gosh, like 10, 12 years ago. Okay. Uh, over on East Johnson Street, right by the Caribou Bar. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you're familiar with Tammy so, Tuesdays then? Uh, oh, yeah. By <laughs> oh, no, Tammy's the best. Of course, I got to give a shout out to Winslow as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Winslow's the man. Okay. Um, I got yelled at by Winslow once for changing the sign on the menu to say jalapeno poopers. <laughs> um, no regrets. I did change it back. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, it, it was, it was a great neighborhood, great time in my life. Um, I didn't realize how significant that promotion, that organization aspect would be in my life until much, much later. But, uh, as I progressed through college, I ended up getting different jobs in one place or another, and it was always revolving around logistics and promotion. So, you know, I've uh, always worked in some kind of logistics, whether it be shipping or receiving or just managing orders that go from one place to another. Okay. Um, I also do a lot of promotional work on my last job that wasn't just for myself as self-employed was at Old Sugar Distillery. Um, I was a production assistant there as well as a bartender, and I managed all of the websites, all the social media campaigns and platforms. I designed all the print ads that went out from there for a few years. And then one day i got an opportunity to start working on event organizing for crafters and local events and it just seemed like everything in my life had slowly been building towards this yeah what kind of uh graphic design style would you say you were doing when you were when you were starting out uh especially you know at the beginning in the early days i definitely um leaned towards um one of my other passions in my life which was photography um okay. you know i was uh, my father was into photography as a hobbyist and it really left a mark on me and i really pursued that as a side hobby for a long time so while i was organizing these events and these shows for people i was doing photography before at other events and shows and using that photography as the basis for the advertising material that i would then create oh okay it, it, so like uh I'm trying to think of uh, I, it's weird. I wanted to ask like what kind of cameras you were using, but it's so, such a weird question these days because it's really evolved more into a simpler type of camera. Like it used to be such a huge deal to go like, what kind of camera were you using? And as I'm ready to ask that, I'm like, does that even matter anymore? You know, I'm sure it does to purists, you know, like uh, there I are came up. I came up thinking the same way you did. Um, yeah. I, I was raised. Uh, I, I don't know if you've heard the old saying, um, uh, Day bodies, Mary Glass. No, I've never heard that. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> once you once you get past like the bottom level of photography where you're just doing it for fun and you start getting money for it, uh -huh. you need like you need to like move into the next level of camera, which is everybody just generally considers DSLRs to be that. Okay. And DSLRs have removable and interchangeable lenses. Um, because you get to this level and the sensors are so fine tuned, so specific and elaborate that you need specific arrangements of glass in front of them to achieve the desired effects because the resolution and clarity that the sensors are capable of is so great that just a single array of glass that does everything just isn't adequate anymore. Mm -hmm. Most old cameras tend to come with a kit lens, you would call it, where it's just like a general range, you know, 15 to 55 millimeters and it zooms in and out and it'll do a lot of stuff but you need a prime lens, you need a telephoto lens, you need a macro lens for all the really specific artsy fartsy stuff. So I got a Nikon, I have a D5500, which isn't even that nice of a camera. You can spend 10 times what I did on a camera, but oh, yeah, I, I'm have sure. like, <laughs> I have like six or seven lenses because I was like ingrained with this idea that you need a specific lens for every job that you want to do. 
And I found more and more as I worked that that was true because the lens that you use in the middle of the day in a field and a sunny day is not the lens you take into your dingy basement in the middle of the night to shoot a band playing. Right. <laughs> okay. And was the were these film too? They weren't digital, or were they digital? It was digital. It was um, digital. I, okay. Because I, I didn't know just if as that digital was done. It. Okay. All right. I wasn't yeah, sure if that affected I, it. My dad was a film photographer, and I always thought that was cool, and I do admire that. But um, I believe it or not, being a digital photographer is way cheaper. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I would imagine it's just like with uh, being a you know a home uh, music recorder. It's just like it's a lot cheaper than go to a studio. I get that there is a give and take, but <laughs> you know it's like, oh, but I can also course. produce a lot more. <laughs> and exactly, and. You know, we live in, a, in an age where, you know, quality often does take the place of quantity, but uh, not as often as we'd like. Well, and so sometimes being able to churn out a bunch of stuff is just as valid. Yeah, well, and it's also the product as well. Uh, sometimes like what you're putting out there, if it still speaks, it's not like, uh, oh, but you shot it on a crappy film or you recorded it with a crappy microphone. It's like, but the outcome is just like, oh, that's really nice. The product itself uh, I don't know. Of course. <laughs> you do get gatekeeping still though i mean oh for I sure find that no matter what i'm interested in there's still people who think that they're better than somebody else because they can afford to do it better or more difficult right and i you encounter that all the time i'm sure oh yeah 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 i i'm i'm very much a uh I, I, even when I am doing stuff that I have to pay for, I still go, well, what's the cheapest option that I can do and still get the amount that I want from it? You know, no, I'm, I'm very yep. much a scrapper when it comes to that type of stuff. <laughs> now, I can respect that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to go back to, you said you were doing the logistics. I'm actually really curious. So you said you were managing inventory and stuff. That's something that, uh, I've never, let me put it this way. I know what spreadsheets are and ways to organize things. Never been a fan of uh, taking the time to learn how to use them. I can go like, uh, this works now and it's probably not the most efficient. So tell me what are, I mean, how would you, what do you use? First of all, like, do you just use a spreadsheet? Do you have a program you like? Like, what do you do for keeping track of stuff? I, Spreadsheets are my jam. Okay, uh, they are. Um, my my spreadsheet game is untouchable. Um, I, uh, <laughs> if, if making spreadsheets was a competition, I am undefeated. You have it, it's wow ridiculous. throwdown. Uh, okay. Oh no, really? I I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the ADHD or what, but for some reason, like the only structured logical thing that always makes sense to me is my spreadsheets. Okay. I can I can find anything in there. I can do anything with them. I have one dedicated group of spreadsheets that I use for each individual event. And then, of course, I have masters for like managing income and promotion and stuff like that. Everything I do now um, is on Google. Okay. Um, it's just, you know, I, I can run my applications. I can run my spreadsheets. I can write my uh, feature posts. I can do everything from one place and save it all to my Google Drive. And I can access it from any device that's logged into it. And, um, and you even can't if it accidentally delete it as well. <laughs> or exactly. lose it. I can't yeah. accidentally delete it and I can find it anywhere and it always works well enough. And yeah. you just can't beat that. Right. I, I agree. I, I actually was a very, very early converter to uh, right when they uh, I'm, I know the history back to like it was originally created by a company called Rightly. And Google bought it out like within months of them doing it. it was an online collaborative document and spreadsheet form. And like it was a standalone company that pretty much got bought up immediately by Google. And up until a few years ago, if you actually studied the code or like did an inspection on the browser, there's still references to rightly like all over it. They finally when they did the update, like a major overhaul update like a year or so ago it finally got all, rid of all that. But you could still find it in there in the code for quite some time. And it was kind of interesting to see. The thing that convinced me that this is what the next step was going to be was I used to work for a smaller company here in town, but it had a few different locations around town. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, each store had a browser somewhere near the front of the store for the employees that had the Google account for each location logged in. And each store could instant chat with each other throughout the entire day. Oh, right. And yeah. the way that that smoothed things out for workflow, for managing inventory, for just 
getting stuff and information and spreadsheets back and forth in real time. It was just nuts. I didn't, I'd never worked somewhere where you could communicate back and forth instantaneously. So once I saw that, I was like, oh man, we're all going to be doing this pretty soon, aren't we? (laughs) (laughs) And then it became a problem. (laughs) And then it got, it got too bad. Now I can't get away from it. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Okay. So I I like that you use that. Um, And yeah, me with spreadsheets, like I'm, I'm learning more, but like I was very reluctant to get into spreadsheets. That was the, I was, I was very much a, I'll never need to use this. Just like in, uh, in high school when I was like, I'll never need to know how to learn how to type. I'm an artist, you know, not realizing that computers were going to take over the world. (laughs) That's one thing I'm glad I kept up with because, um, uh, Megan, Megan remarks constantly at uh, how horrible my handwriting is. I'm told I have the handwriting of a doctor. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. It's I can't even read my own handwriting sometimes, honestly. <laughs> mine, mine. If I pay attention, it's good, but for the most part, um, yeah, it's not. And then um, I'm I rely too much on spell check these days. So um, I mean, to the point where I expect there to be a red underline if I wrote it wrong. You know, like like it doesn't adopt where you misspell and it's like no you misspelled that like i fully expect that to happen when i write it down on paper so i just don't do that in front of people uh, <laughs> you know i don't write in front easier. of people yeah let me let me email it to you um and then so now you've been running the madison makers market for um how many years now the makers market has actually been going on since 2017 yeah um but i took over in 2019 okay 2019. So, so, you know, so, right before no, no big life changes happening, uh, soon after that. <laughs> it was, I, I was in charge just long enough to really get the feel for it and get my feet under me. And then, um, and then the machete that is COVID just came through right. and just cut me down. Yeah. Um, but you know, I tried. I tried to be flexible. I didn't want to let it bring me down. I didn't want to let it bring my makers down. So as soon as the uh, COVID hit, I tried to look around and see if other people were coming up with solutions to the same problem that we were all dealing with. I'm not the only organizer. I'm oh, the only no. person trying to sell or get people together. Right. And I realized that web markets was starting to become kind of a thing, or people were testing the waters on this. So I looked around, I did a little research, and I tried to put together a couple web-based markets where basically I would just spend two or three weeks just in a flurry posting about various makers and linking to all of their sales outlets so that you could find them and their stuff, even if you couldn't physically see their products in person. Yeah. And, you know, I tried to make it as cheap as humanly possible, basically just like help me handle the advertising costs and I'll cover everything else because I don't have to pay for print media. I don't have to rent any venues out anymore. So really, I just need a couple bucks from everybody to help, you know, boost posts, basically. Right. And I thought it went okay for a minute, but honestly, just the entire Internet just kind of just kind of gave up on this idea after about six months. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a difficult thing. And I do want to ask a few more questions about that, but I do want to make sure that we jump into like how you did get started with it. I I still do want to know that part. I know that I jumped right in with the, okay, then there was the pandemic and we had virtual stuff. And I do, I do really have a few questions about that, but before we get into that, tell me about actually becoming the person who runs the maker's market in 2019. So this show was actually originally run by a friend of mine, uh, Sarah. Yeah. Um, she ran a business called No Coast Paper Company. Mm-hmm. And uh, she she ran into an issue that a lot of makers, a lot of local artists and artisans have, which is just that, you know, when you attend craft shows, you're, you're often at the whim and the will of the organizers themselves. You're depending on them to have the understanding and the knowledge and the execution to represent you well, to promote you, to bring about that awareness to the public and to bring the crowd to you. Because you can only do so much yourself, especially if you're a younger or newer or aspiring artist who hasn't had that much time to work on that. So as somebody who had a little bit of free time, she realized that um, a great way to solve this problem would be to try to organize the event yourself. You know, it's possible that all these people organize these shows differently because they learn from experience that it's not as easy as it looks from the outside. So she started trying to put on some really small events, just a couple venues at a time, just trying to get a few dozen makers together and just see how this concept of event organization and promotion works out. She also had a similar background to me. She went to college for graphic design and advertising. She didn't have the same logistics background, but honestly, I think that's something you can learn if you just pay attention, take notes. And Sarah's a very smart person. So 
Yeah. She did a lot of work, a lot of research. She put a couple of events down. And after a couple of events, one of the venues she started doing them at was Old Sugar Distillery, where I was an employee at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <laughs> I was working during these events and seeing how much of an impact it made on the local economy, on the place I was working at, on the artists who were showing up trying to make a living. And it was just, I'd never seen anything quite like that before. I'd attended the crafty fair, but you're just there for an hour. You don't see what this actually does to people for yeah. five, six hours straight, how much it impacts so many people. So to just be there for eight hours and see how much of an impact it made was just amazing to me. And I immediately fell in love with craft fairs. I wanted to be a part of them in some way. So I became friends with Sarah. Mm -hmm. It's like, if nothing else, I can help you. I can work with you on this. And maybe we can like, you know, you can teach me and I can like help you put these shows on. Yeah. Time goes by. I eventually get my foot in the door and I'm helping Sarah work on these shows and we're having a great time. And then she messages me one day and says, my wife just got a job offer. And if she takes it, we have to move to California. Mm -hmm. Is there any way you'd be interested in taking over Madison Makers Market? <laughs> it's like, wait, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> Did you just ask me if I want to do my dream job? <laughs> <laughs> which which that is like, that, that's so interesting that it was like, you were the go-to. You were the one, like, it, you were just working at one of the venues. And here it was like, hey, do you want to take this over? That's that's the part that I find fascinating. It's it's how, how you got started with it is just literally, she said, do you want to do this now? <laughs> It's it's the weirdest thing, Tom. I don't know how this keeps happening. I blame Megan. Um, <laughs> She's an astonishingly positive, proactive person. Yeah. Uh, one of the many reasons I love her. And I have learned from hanging out with her for the last like eight years that if you just make time for things and open yourself up to the possibility that of a new experience or a new effort or a new idea, you'd be surprised where it'll take you as long as you just approach it with an open mind and a sense of enthusiasm. So no matter whether it's working for taco cat or working for the maker's market or working for one of the part-time jobs I had, if you just make time for it and show up and try to be interested in it, things will happen. And it was the same thing with the maker's market. And as soon as I saw it, I realized how interesting it was. I realized how much of an impact it made. And I wanted to be a part of that effort. And just by telling that person how I felt, they were enamored with the idea. They wanted help anyway, because it's a big job and it was a lot of work. And just by being there, being in that proximity and learning directly from the person who did it, they realized like, well, hey, maybe this guy has what it takes to keep this going for a minute. Maybe you can make this work. And they asked and here I am. Yeah. And well, and it is as simple as that. But at the same time, it's like, OK, you said, yes, I want to do it. So now what? <laughs> you you know? do have to be willing to work really, really hard. I should mention that. I yeah, guess. That, that's what I'm getting at. Is It's like, it's one thing to go like, this would be really, really cool. But it's just like when you start any new job, it's like, here's what I think it is. But really, how do I do this? You know, you were involved, but it's different to be on the running side rather than the helping side. So what, what was it yeah. like when you first were like, yes, I'll do it. And then, and then it was like, here's what you got to know. And you kind of like worked, like, I'm, I'm assuming there was a training period with Sarah to, uh, to help you out. Correct. Cool. You know what, actually? Oh, I have it here. One sec. Okay. This is a binder. Okay. That Sarah made for me with highlighted notations and instructions for every single aspect of how she ran the maker's market okay. at that time. Well, so I was already working with her, but she left me this whole thing. It's about 30 sheets long about every single step of how she did things just in case I had questions and she was too busy to text me back or something. <laughs> so, but before that all happened, actually, what happened was I was working with her on shows and what I was doing was I was just asking questions whenever I had it. So it was like, okay. well, okay, so I want to help. What's the thing you need help with? Okay. So you need help getting out uh, media. You need help getting postcards, posters put up, hung out around town. So I had to ask how that was done. I had to ask how to do one thing or another piece by piece. Mm. And what was really interesting was seeing the parallels between how Sarah was doing different parts of her job and how I had done different jobs in the past. How you so? Know, I had to do, well, like a great example is like organizing uh, makers into venues and assigning booths, pure logistics. You oh. just have criteria that you need to meet. You just have different types of products that need to fit into different places by specific rules and criteria. 
that's pure logistics. That's all that is. Mm -hmm. Once you get past the person to person, the actual like emotional aspect, which is figuring out, well, like, how does this person's stuff look? How do they relate to the public? What's the quality? Do they know how to promote themselves? Yada, yada, yada. Once you get past that, you're just talking about how do I organize and sort these people? Purely just math. Okay. And as long as you can keep up with that, as long as you have experience with that concept, it's just a cakewalk. Okay. Um, really, the worst part about organizing and choosing vendors is having to say no. But the actual math of selecting and organizing people is is very objective. Okay. It's the only way to do it well. If I put emotion into the process, if I make it an emotional decision, then I'm just going to let all my friends in and that's not going to bring the show forward or improve right. it at all. I would have a hard time like going, sorry, we're full. You know, it's. <laughs> that's, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because I mean, there's some people that I really would like to be able to be a part of the show. And a lot of the times it's just because I really like personally what it is that they make. Yeah. But that's not always good enough you know just because i think what you do is cool isn't necessarily the reason you get into this show just like just because i don't necessarily like something that you make it doesn't mean that you don't get into the show um at a show that i'm working on right now that's coming up in a couple of weeks um i have i think 25 different people who make jewelry I haven't worn a piece of jewelry since I was in high school, oh, but yeah. that's not a reason not to include people. You know, I of have course. to be out there thinking about what my audience's sisters did it. Mm -hmm. I'm making a show for everybody all at the same time. So I have to be mindful of what's popular, what's interesting to people, what people are looking for. And thank goodness we live in the age of social media because I have analytics to look at to really help me figure that out. True. Um, but it's very, very important because, you know, I'm not marketing to myself. I'm marketing to everybody. Okay. And now with all this in play, it's different when day one, you're running your first one, you started and you do it. Like, how did that play out? How did it go? What was it like running the first one? Like, what was your first experience running an actual live event? And I believe I was at that one, <laughs> if I'm and not you mistaken. Were, yeah. actually. So, so the one that you were at was actually the first show that I ever ran front to back. Yeah, but I was I actually got to take a lead role in the show before that for day of because like there's different stages for organizing this show. Um, you know, there's the first step, which is obviously setting dates and uh, confirming with venues. And then I have to set up all the background logistics for that, you know, putting the application together, designing all the media and advertising stuff. And then I have to release the application, make that public, do all that fun stuff. And how do you, and, then, and this is only, I, I know that uh, I only just learned about it from uh, meeting uh, Tammy who tables at your events uh, uh, from no, Bohemian Bob. Like, like I yeah. knew nothing about them and, and she told me about them and I was just like, this is fascinating to me. I still don't understand what you're saying, but I would love to try it. You know, like even up to the point of doing it, I still didn't really know what it was or get it. Like it was one of those things where it's like, I think it's this, but you know, it, what threw me was the name pop-up event. Uh, that's why I'm glad you guys call it make, uh, Maker's Market, but which makes more sense to me. But Tammy kept referring to it as a pop-up event. And I just kept thinking of it uh, as an actual function in my head, like, like, whoop, like they would pop up. Like, I, I know it's stupid, but I, I kept no, seeing that's, like that's an your actual pop-up. That's and web designer background. Yeah, <laughs> like for me, it's a physical movement. Like, uh, like, it was a, like it was a flash mob and we were all just going to show up out of nowhere and be at these places. Like it was, that's the way I, and I couldn't get my head, I, I never got the concept until I was there. Like, oh, this is just like an event, but they call it a pop-up because it doesn't stay here. You know, that was, anyway. So uh, in doing that, uh, what I was getting at is like, organizing the venues too like how do you so you're sending out these these calls to action and i learned from tammy it's like just follow the facebook group and you'll hear about when they do the call up and then you'll find out right do you do that or do you have an email list that you send it out to too so i do a couple different things just to create the awareness um i have an email list that you can sign up for on the website the madisonmakersmarket.com and that adds you to a contact list that I, I, I use. I email people for that. That's when I announce that the application for a given event is open. I announce that it's about to close or it has closed. And I also, you know, announce, um, you know, load in and venue information and stuff through that. But then I also use Instagram and Facebook as well. You know, I obviously have the event itself on Facebook, which I have to update the description and information for pretty regularly. I have a page on the website for the event itself, which also has to be current and updated. 
and then I make regular posts on Facebook and Instagram announcing when the application opens, where you can find it. Every single post about it has a link directly to it. I, of course, have a link tree in my Instagram profile, so you can find mm -hmm. every application that's currently open. And then I'll, on my website also, you can find every open application just by clicking around on there. Visibility, visibility. You have to post nonstop for like two or three weeks right. about it just to make sure every single person finds it, which creates you know, a good thing and a bad thing because lately I've been getting way too many applicants for these shows. Mm -hmm. Like it's what I want. I want a lot of applications in, but like for the show that I have coming up, I only have 120 spots and I had 200 applications for it. Right. So that's goes back to our problem where just because you're good doesn't mean you're necessarily getting in because I physically cannot say yes to every single person that wants to be there. Um, yeah, it, it just kind of is what it is. Right. Yeah. And, and it's funny too, because even that, like going back to learning about it and kind of Tammy telling me about it. And even then she, she said, follow these uh, places. But then I kind of had to wait a year to like go, well, what are the different, like I had to go like, oh, this event is happening now. Now I should follow that page. Like I wasn't, there's no real place to go like, where are all the events that you can apply for? And oddly enough, one of the people that I told that to there was a person who kind of disappeared from the maker's market. She it was a uh, uh, stitch boom bang. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like out of nowhere. I, I I don't know where she went. I've tried contacting her. Haven't heard from her. It was, it, it's, it was a very great person who did great embroidery uh, portraits of uh, pop stars from the eighties. <laughs> I loved her stuff. It was so great. Um, but she was just like, Oh, here I've, I've made an extensive spreadsheet and she sent it to me and gave me a whole list. And I found out then that was ones from basically all of Southern Wisconsin. And it was intense. There, I didn't know there were so many. And that's what I'm saying. Like, even though you're promoting this, like there, there are like 10 other ones that I learned about, like maybe a year or so later, like it's, it, there's no real, like, here's a list of all. And that's the way it is for anything, like any kind of organization and, or, you know, medium it's, it's, there's no like, who are the people we should send these to sort of lists. And it's not uncommon, but that is one it's, thing it's that was hard. It's a big give and take. Yeah. And and that comes back around to, uh, so there is actually a face, uh, there's actually several now, but there are Facebook groups now that actually really help to organize because this is a huge issue. Um, working for Taco Cat, I had the same problem. You know, um, there was one year where we did 72 events in one year and I had to find these events. You know, I only knew about so many of them, but I had to depend on other vendors that we knew. I had to depend on word of mouth, uh, just random things I see on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And eventually Facebook groups started popping up where people would start organizing and posting about events. And then you start seeing those spreadsheets start showing up here and there. There's one that's actually a South Central Wisconsin vendor and art oh, group. Really? Okay. And um, there's actually a spreadsheet there that lists about 200 different craft fairs that happen in Southern Central Wisconsin in any given year. It's very out of date. Some of those shows don't exist anymore, but it is oh. such a great place to start from. Totally. Because a lot of us are going from nowhere. You know, one of the uh, things that's really important, I feel, as the organizer for the makers market is to be as helpful to newer makers that reach out to me for information and help as possible. Yeah. So anytime a maker reaches out to me and is curious about how to find shows or resources for like hardware that they need or what kind of things they should do to prepare or promote for a show, I have like a little group of links to Facebook groups and websites and stuff that I send to anybody who reaches out to me because like it's really hard to find that information by yourself. Yeah. And you know, I have this ability to be this resource for all these people to help them get a leg up and to figure out how to be competitive in the marketplace. And I feel that it's, you know, an opportunity and an obligation. Yeah, no. And I think that's cool because I think another thing too, and knowing other people that have applied for events and stuff, it kind of, I mean, given it is, you know, there's so many people applying, but it can be like, oh, they just don't want me in it because they don't know who I am, you know? And it's like, well, that's not necessarily it. And so being able to go like, but you should try these ones. Like that makes it feel like I, it, it's not like going, I, I'm really busy. I can't talk right now where they're just going, oh, they're just blowing me off. It's like, no, I really am busy. I can't talk right now. <laughs> but here, if you can do this or you can go here, like they might be able, it just shows a, a little bit of respect for the people. Like it's scary to apply for the first time anyway. So I think that's really cool yes. that you do offer those resources. And that was what I was getting at is like when I first started, if it weren't for Tammy, I still would, I'd probably still to this day be going like, how the hell do I sign up for this? Or who do I talk to? You know, <laughs> honestly, when, when people like Tammy or Ange from like toss and found, when they yeah. stop selling, 
it's going to be such a big change in the craft fair scene because like <laughs> they're from the old guard. Yeah. You know, they, they were doing this stuff, you know, back in like the nineties and early two thousands mm-hmm. when like the craft scene in Wisconsin was finally starting to make a resurgence from where it had been back in the seventies and eighties. And this was before technology was a resource and a tool. So right. they started developing their businesses when you had to do everything organically and uh, analog. And then they got to do this and build their businesses as technology became an option and an avenue for promotion and sales. So the depth and breadth of information that people like Tammy have about how to be a functional, successful small business is invaluable. Like if I could start another small business, just like taking out everything they know and putting it in a magazine to share with other people, (laughs) because like. I you could interview any one of them for weeks about the stuff that they've learned. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I it, I still learn stuff from Tammy to this day when when I run into her. It's it's funny. Um, and then also watch this transition. Speaking of from the old ways to the new ways, so I really do want to find out about when uh, COVID happened, and I know that you did. You had a uh, markets scheduled. Oh, I mean, it was around for a year, so you had markets scheduled throughout the whole year, and you did do different things. Um, you did the yep. one that you were saying, so you started off before saying that you were doing, uh, multi posts and, and, and just really posting it and boosting it and sharing that. But you also did, um, uh, try to do as, as everybody was then diving into the live streaming sort of thing, you did try to do a virtual market and yes, I did. Yeah. So how did you organize that? Like, tell me about the experience of doing that. Cause it was, everybody was trying to do that. There were ways to do it, but it's still on both ends, the user and the organizer it's it's a difficult thing to navigate around man it was it was awkward as hell um again because it's, it's a brand new format as a concept so we were all just kind of feeling around in the dark trying to do this so i looked at what a couple other people were doing and some of those markets hadn't even gone live yet so i was just like extrapolating what they were talking about yeah and what i came to the conclusion was that if you did it for like a single day or only a couple of days that would be presuming a lot about people's schedule and availability or finances. Yeah. So I thought that like running the event for too short a time wouldn't give people enough time to get the exposure that they wanted. So I knew right away that like we needed to run this for a long time frame, two, three weeks. And not only does that give me time to post about more people, it allows me to post more about each individual person. Mm. So instead of like, cause if we're running for like two weeks and I post about you one time, then like people are going to forget about you a week or never even know that I posted about you. But if I were on the show for 50 or 60 people for three weeks, I can post about you three, four or five times a week. And yeah. that's going to make sure that everybody gets that visibility and exposure they're looking for. So I knew that that kind of format was going to be really, really important. I knew that like it was really important to be able to work with people that had like simple, easy communication methods. So whatever the best way to reach you was, I needed to know what that was so I could talk about it and post that information okay. when I mentioned you. Because not everybody has a Facebook page, but I still need to be able to post about you on Facebook. But like, oh, you only use your email? Well, then tell me what your email is because I won't be able to be able to find you. Right. So making sure I had really up-to-date, current, effective contact information, making sure I post about people on a really frequent, consistent basis, which is actually something that informed all my promotion uh, strategy going forward. Even though I do in-person events now, I find that scheduling and organizing and arranging posts far in advance makes my life way less stressful. And that's something that I inadvertently learned by doing these web markets, which is yeah. cool. Um, and then when it came to the events themselves, you know, like it, you need people to like have images that I can post to talk about your stuff. Some people wanted to do videos. Some people wanted to do other formats. So I had to be able to work with everybody to do what made the most sense for us. Okay. So like, you know, if some people want to like share a sound snippet of them talking about their stuff, like, well, that doesn't really work on social media. But if you have a video you want to share where you talk about your stuff, I can include that with a little blurb about you. And I did that for a few people. But I found the best thing to do was three to five images. Show me a decent cross section of your product catalog, the different things you have available. And then post passionately. Yeah. Write a really engaged, interested post about why I think this is really interesting or why I think you'll find a lot of value in this. Mm-hmm. And really just combining all those things over and adding in that long time frame, I think posting and boosting posts pretty periodically, like I would usually make an ad post 
that I would run for two weeks and I would usually have two of those overlapping for the entire length of the event. Okay. And that really helped get a lot more engagement as well. Yeah. And you would target those posts to the region around Madison. Yep. So I had, I will always have one ad that was specifically Madison. Mm -hmm. And then I have another general post that was intended to reach Wisconsin in general. Oh, okay. So you do actually go for the whole state. Yeah. Okay. I think it's really important to try to read, especially with the web market, it was really important to try to reach a broader audience because now I have access to people that can't drive to Madison, but right. that won't anyway, that don't need to. Yeah. So like, why not advertise to you if you all you have to do is click on a link to buy this person's stuff? Yeah. Okay. And now when you were able to get back into places again, I also, in this was actually like, this goes all across the board to how you do it anyway. But I'm curious, how do you secure a venue? How do you go like, hey, we want to do this here? I mean, that's, and you know, that's not easy. Or, good question. or is it easy? Question. I don't know. <laughs> it's sort of weird, honestly. Because um, what what I'm doing is is both unique and not unique at the same time. You know, I'm not the only person who's tried to rent out a bar. It's right. just that what I'm doing with that space is a little different to what people are used to. Yeah. So the first time you try to secure a venue is always the weirdest because it depends on who you're trying to reach out to. Nowadays, it's much, much easier. Now people come to me asking if I will organize an event at their place. Oh, nice. Um, Brag. So I don't even have to find people anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, it <laughs> saved me so much stress. Cause yeah, like, totally. How do you go out like... I have to write this super awkward email being like, hey, you've never heard of me and you've probably never heard of what I do. Yeah. That is this thing where I get a bunch of strangers together to meet up with a bunch of other strangers and trade money for goods. And they'll and be like, who I is this? <laughs> <laughs> but like I'm finding I found more and more as I did it to like, you know, I'm what we're doing is far more common and accepted a practice than you think it is. You remember, I grew up in Northern Wisconsin, craft fairs and craft events weren't as big a thing as you might think. Hmm. You know, we all tend to be a little more insular and isolated. Green Bay is, in particular is a very uh, conservative town. So we're very much in fans of buying from Yonkers and Target and Walmart. And that's what I grew up around. So coming down here and seeing the craft fair scene, blew my mind that is a concept to see how huge and how big it was yeah so i come down here and i try to reach out to these venues and say i want to put a craft fair on in your space and they're already familiar with this conceptually they just never have happened to them okay so i just try to explain what it is i'm doing how i'm trying to put it together and ask are you interested period not talking about dates is this something you would want to work with me on oh all? that's smart actually that that you mentioned that yeah like yeah like instead of going all the way through and going, we'd like these days and here's what just going like, I do this. Would this be oh, something you'd want to do? And if not, then it's yeah. like, okay, you didn't spend too much time on that. Okay. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. Huh? I like the that. idea is I want to be able to work with these people a lot in the future. So I would hate to make them think this is like a one-time experience or that I'm just trying to hit it and quit it. Yeah. So I, I think it's really important to establish if they're interested in building a relationship together, because this is really helping everybody involved. You know, I'm not just doing this because I need to get my makers in somewhere so that I can help them sell stuff. Yeah. This is good for your business, too, because I'm bringing people to your space that might have never heard from me before because I'm advertising in a way that you don't. So I'm reaching an audience that you might not have otherwise had access to or might not have reached otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I'm bringing them to you and exposing them to your brand in a way that's different from what you're used to. And I think there's a lot of value in that. Mm -hmm. So explaining that to them is also a great way to get them interested because nobody says no to advertising or promotion. Right. That's True. And I mean, they, they, I wouldn't say nobody, somebody might do it like going, no, this isn't true. on brand or whatever, well, that, but you know, and sometimes things like fall apart. Like, um, for a while I was working with a working draft. Okay. And, uh, I still really like that place. I'd been drinking there since I stopped working with them. But one day I just stopped getting emails back from the person who I've been talking to there. And I didn't know what was happening, but I also don't want to be rude or right. assume anything. So I just left it alone. It's like, if you're not going to respond to my emails, I assume it's for a good reason and I'm not going to press the matter. So I just let them not be a part of the shows anymore. And then I find out um, early this year that the person I was talking to left the brewery. And that's probably why oh. I wasn't able to contact them anymore because they didn't work there. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I just have to send out a new email and reintroduce myself. And we're like, Hey, do you guys want to do anything? <laughs> there was, I was in a, uh, a, a, a Irish band for a while that performed like Tuesdays at back when it used to be the King club on King street. Um, mm. I was and we were in, and we performed on Tuesdays and we'd always get asked to do the St. Patrick's day parade. And I did that for like two years and then we broke up or we stopped doing it or the other members went back to the kissers or whatever. Something happened, but we stopped doing it. But nobody gave that memo to the person that ran the parade. And we continued to do the parade every year and get paid for it for like, I want to say 10 years. And then finally one day that person didn't work there anymore. And we didn't get asked that next year. So like, I was like, Oh, they, I, at first I was like, they found out about it. And then it turned out the organizer actually got a different job and they didn't know who we were. So like the person who organized it just never checked to see if we were still a band. They'd always, they'd stop the parade and go, where are you guys performing tonight? And I'd go, yeah, say happy St. Patrick's day and That's pretend like amazing. I didn't hear them. Anyway, that's Happy a, accident. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, you reminded me of that. That's why I wanted to tell that story. But that's now, funny. now with all this, what would you say is the most difficult thing about running this now that you've been doing it for a few years? And we've mentioned quite a few difficult things, but what would you say, like at its core, would you go, this was the toughest thing that I had to learn doing this? The thing that like about this whole job front to back that I still struggle with on a pretty consistent basis is finding a way to make it fit in with the rest of my life, honestly. Okay. You know, uh, this isn't the only thing I do. I I, I also work full time for uh, my other business with my partner, and mm -hmm. I have seven cats at home, one of whom has cancer, and I have to like take care of all of this. I have to make all of this work all the time. You know, at the events, um, I have a hundred people who are depending on me to make sure that I do everything in a timely, logical fashion, in a way that supports and maintains the brand. Because if I don't do that, then I'm letting all these people down and harming the brand in the long term. And that's not good for anybody. But on top of that, I also had this whole other relationship with this whole other person in this business that we built together. That's also hugely important to me and a big part of my life. Yeah. And how do you, how do you take care of all these things? How do you balance all the needs and demands of this much in one day mm -hmm. and still sleep eight hours at night? And being able to do that in general, just as sort of a ephemeral concept is very, very, very difficult for me. I struggle with that a lot on a pretty consistent basis. Yeah. But are you doing okay managing it? I mean, you're, you seem like you're doing good. It's, I, I don't want it to sound like, and stuff is hard and, and you know, and I don't want to make it seem like my <laughs> life is falling apart. Either That's what I'm getting at. I'm... I mean, like I said, I, I so like doing this, is is great because one of the things that um uh, again like hanging out with somebody like megan you you learn to appreciate certain things in a different light because i was raised a certain way and view things a certain way so different perspectives are invaluable especially when they're constructive yeah and the, one of the things i learned just by being with and hanging out around somebody like her is that it is it is so important to find joy in the things that you do to find a reason to have passion for the things that you do. Yeah. You know, it, not everything that you do is going to be easy or fun or good. You know, the, every job that you have, no matter what it is, is going to be crummy for one reason or another, but that doesn't mean that it's a bad job or it's a bad career path. It's right. just how it is. Work is work. Mm -hmm. But you can find things about that that you have joy in, that you take pride in, that you want to do and look forward to. And knowing that and internalizing that as a philosophy really helps a lot because I don't dread waking up in the morning and trying to balance two jobs. Yeah. I look forward to the fact that I get to do the best things in the world with the people that I care about the most. I get to wake up, I get to work in a studio that I pay for with money that I earn with my partner. Right. I on a laptop that I bought with money that I earn organizing <laughs> events, which I do specifically for the purpose of helping other people find a market and an audience for things that they truly passionately care about making and sharing with the world. Yeah. And like, that's the coolest job in the world. Like, right. how could I not be excited about that every single day? And of course I find time to do all these things, but man, I tell you, if the day were like 48 hours longer, I'd, I'd be unstoppable. If I could just like not sleep. We say that. I, and I've thought that too, but 
would we? <laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, would we I'd just probably find play more, more video way- games. Yeah, well, <laughs> would we? Yeah, would we just find more ways to make it like, oh, but now that I can do this, I wanted to do this. You know, it's it's, and that's the I drive. Think, that's that's also yeah. the drive that you know, knowing the oh, if I could just do this in this, you, you don't give up when you say you wish you had. 48 hours you go man think of what i could accomplish even more if i had that many hours and that's what i'm getting at is like and then when we have those it'd be like but think of more that i could do and that's good that's good drive really to tell you the truth so i i don't see that kind of thought process as a as a negative and not that it was taken as a negative but like i know that it sucks to go like i wish i had more time but if you really well, are think, like going think of what i could do if i had that time i think that's a positive you know and i think it's really important to keep in mind who you are to know who you are as a person, because who you are is a big part of like what it is that you need from what you're doing. Yeah. You know, what you need out of your life, out of your day to day life, your career path is different from what I need. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I learned as a person with ADHD is that I function extremely well under pressure, Mm. like better than I do when I'm not under pressure. So as much as it's kind of awkward, like I need to be under a little bit of pressure to function efficiently. I get that. So like it's it's not ideal, but honestly, it is. I, I, I need that little bit of extra pressure behind me to get things done in a timely and efficient manner because that's how I do it. I do functions so so well when there is a ticking clock when there is a deadline out there on the horizon then i can see if it's too close i shut down but you know (laughs) that's why i have like three to four months to plan an event because i know that i can operate efficiently and functionally in that kind of time frame well and like you said you can also plan out for it so that it's scheduled and you and that's even mapping out ahead of time but that's still scheduling and then when it happens you're like okay this fired off so that means this next thing has to happen it's still, even though it's easier, it's like you get to watch it happen. And that's got to be, that's got to be somewhat of a good feeling going like, okay, things are firing off properly, properly, you know, that's, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Once you start getting into like the, the good parts where things start moving along and you get this nice ordered structure for your day, you know, exactly how it's going to go for the next like six weeks. Oh, that's the butter spot. That's yeah. like where all the good stuff happens. <laughs> And then uh, one more thing I want to ask, too, is because you mentioned it, the new studio you're in. Tell me a little bit about it. Why, how long have you guys been there? And, uh, you know, we've been here since October now. Um, man, I love it here. I so I, I, I mentioned, you know, we have we have pets. We have seven cats at home. Yeah. And as much as I love all of them dearly, um, they they also love me. And the way they express that is by getting all over me and the things that I'm trying to do. So being able to go somewhere that is peaceful, quiet, and organized to focus <laughs> on what I need to do is so, so helpful. Like, I like right. being distracted, but I prefer to be distracted on my terms. And cats don't care what your plans are, what you're trying to get done. Yes. So, right. And Especially like, that many of them. Which is fine. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like to tell people, once you get above, like, four cats, they do like to form their own sort of social hierarchy. But unfortunately, you're at the bottom of it. Right. So you're still like bound to their wins. Well, and um, you are the ones that post pictures of them online. So, you know, <laughs> our products are named after some of our cats, you know? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah. But it, it and so uh, what was the how did you guys end up moving in there? Like what made you go like we finally need to get a place like I get the the separation, but you still got to pay for it. <laughs> Honestly, the big thing was so we we've, we've tried to do this before. Um we actually um in 2019, uh funnily enough, tried to have a studio space. Okay. Um we we live in a duplex apartment and uh our neighbors in the other half of our house were moving out and our landlord knew that we were a small business and they were cool with us operating out of our apartment and they actually uh brought up the idea that, like if you're interested in renting out a second space, you could rent the other half of this house. Oh yeah. Okay. And that sounded really, really appealing. So we ran at this idea. We're like, okay, so like we, we have, we can afford the cost of it. And we already had an employee at the time. So we knew we could cover that. It was just the thing that we needed was space. We didn't have enough space. The bigger your business grows, the more physical volume it takes up. And we're living in a one bedroom apartment. You can't have seven cats, two people and an entire company Mm -hmm. in there very efficiently. So 
we ran at it. We moved all of our stuff in there and we even hired a second employee and we were chugging along. It was going great. Drove out to California for a show that year. That was fun. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then COVID happened and we realized very, very quickly that all of our money was about to evaporate. So we had to just shut everything down. We had to announce that okay. we were vacating our lease. We had to lay off our employees and we had to basically move our entire apartment into the second floor and then move our entire business into the first floor of our apartment. And we hung out like that throughout all of COVID. And we basically were just biding our time because it hurt our business, it hurt our brand, it hurt our income, uh, just to have to like restructure ourselves so severely, so quickly. So we just needed some time to lick our wounds and heal a little bit. And once we finally felt like we were getting there, um, we were looking around and we couldn't find anything that we could afford. And then, Um, while we were looking for that studio space back in 2019, we had talked to the people at Commonwealth Development at one point and looked at a couple spaces and I built up a rapport with somebody who worked in the same building with the Sugar Distillery. So I started looking around and I was having a hard time finding anything. And then out of nowhere, it was like as if she was psychic, but Rebecca from Commonwealth Development sent me an email out of the blue saying like, hey. I remember talking to you and showing you a couple units a couple years ago, and I just wanted to see how you guys are doing, what Taka Cat was up to, and if you were still looking for anything, because I just had a couple spaces that just came available, and we hadn't even listed them on the website yet. So hmm. we're like, okay. Yeah. So we go out, we make it a meeting with her, and we come out and we look at this specific spot, uh, as well as a couple of the ones, I think. And this was perfect. It was in our price range. It was well within our budget. It was a perfect land. It's just a hallway. It's a 20 foot by 50 foot hallway, yeah. which is exactly what I need. <laughs> Cause we can just, I mean, you, you, you see in apartments, there's windows, there's chimneys, there's all sorts of random doors and walls <laughs> all over the place. I'm a logistics man. This is a nightmare for me. So, so just give me a blank floor plan and right. I'll fit anything in there. So we look at this place, it's everything that we want in the world. And then they tell us, all right, so this is what you have to do to apply for this space. And I literally had to learn generally accepted accounting principles in order to create the documentation that I needed in order to apply for this space. I'm basically a CPA without the paperwork. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. But I hate it. So we still have an accountant. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's yeah i could get that it's I, i've never been good at math so i like so the weird thing is i'm actually still good at math the thing that i can't understand is bureaucratic language the oh, way yeah. that things are written on tax forms is i can't read it it doesn't make sense to me it just it means nothing but the numbers i'm good with that part i can do yeah okay <clears throat> so anyway, we and got i'm bad at both so there we go <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thank God that you're a musician and an artist. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I'd be more successful if I paid attention in math. Anyway, um, <laughs> but well, I'm glad that you got that place. I I did want to find out about that, and I've been really enjoying the the posting of you guys getting ready and painting it's been the so stuff. Nice. It's really cool. I and, love this place. Yeah, and if there's uh, if people did want to check out more about the Madison Makers Market, where should they go to find out more information or contact you? Ah, that is uh, easy. So you can find me on my website, um, www.madisonmakersmarket.com. Um, if you just want to shoot me a straight message, um, you can email me at info at madisonmakersmarket.com. You can find me on Facebook at just Madison Makers Market. Um, I'm on Instagram at, at Madison Makers Market. And um, I post pretty frequently on social media. The website, I try to keep it as active and up to date as humanly possible. Um, and I answer all my messages, although it might take me a day or two to get around to it because it's just one guy. Mm-hmm. But uh, I try to be as active and communicative as humanly possible. Right. As much as a guy with that much stuff going on can. So I, I can attest to that. It's, it, we, we were able to connect for this interview. And I want to thank you for doing it. I'm really glad that I got the chance to talk with you about it. And I've wanted to learn more about the maker's market. So thank you so much. Thank you.